and this afternoon. I was here a little bit earlier than this morning. Um, to clarify what Mac had said, uh, the class is going to be on the 24th, and I believe if I looked at my calendar right, that is this Friday. Uh, would be the fourth Friday. So for those who are not normally here, we have a Sinners Anonymous class on the second and fourth Fridays of the month. Uh, so that is this coming Friday. Uh, we have not got to have that in about a month and a half, two months. So we have three lessons left, and uh, hopefully this will be a good lesson for this Friday at 7 p.m. here at the building. Uh, I'm going to break a lot of my own personal rules. We're going to put up most of the passages on the board. I have a lot of scriptures to go through. Uh, I hope to not bog you down and have to return to all of those. Uh, so they're going to be up on the board if you would like to read them there. Uh, if you guys want a list of them without having to write all of them down, I can provide that too. Uh, we're going to hop into a topic that um, may be a bit more of my own personal curiosity more than anyone else's interest. I try to avoid my hobby horses, but in this case, um, I want to share with you some of those. The terms of sacrifice and contrition comes up quite a bit in the Old Testament. And specifically, what I want to talk about is the idea of sacrifice as being something that God doesn't want. There are several times uh, throughout the Old Testament where God, or obviously there's a whole book in the Old Testament where God describes all of the sacrifices that he wants. Uh, if you guys have done any of the reading through the Bible in a year, you probably did pretty good up until Leviticus. Uh, and then you kind of got bogged down and said, well, uh, all those sacrifices got really boring with their terminology. And so God gives a lot of laws concerning Old Testament sacrifices. I mean, this was a part of Israel's yearly and daily lives. If you ever take the time to kind of figure out how many sacrifices would have happened at the place of, at the, um, at the altar every day, uh, the amount of blood is rather kind of unfathomable. But at the same time, there are many times where God tells Israel that he does not delight in sacrifices or that he doesn't want them. And it's kind of shocking if you think about it in those terms. That here he gives you the entire book of Leviticus to talk about all the sacrifices that he wants. Here's all the ones that you are required to go through. And yet, throughout Old Testament scriptures, he says he doesn't like them, doesn't want them, hasn't required it of them. And you kind of have to scratch your head and wonder why. So what I want to do is I want to run through a bunch of those scriptures this morning and maybe figure out a pattern to it and figure out why. Uh, we're then going to talk about the idea of contrition or being contrite. Look at a handful of passages concerning that and then hopefully make some good New Testament application to this Old Testament principle. So the question is, why would God bother to command, or both command so many sacrifices, make a priesthood, we're going to dock my secretary a couple points, uh, make a priesthood to serve the altar, and then condemn people for making those sacrifices. Uh, if you were in our Bible class this morning, this afternoon, uh, this was a topic that came up here in Malachi. So we're going to be talking about that at Malachi as well. So running through a few passages, uh, Psalm 40, verses 6 through verse 8, a Psalm of David. Uh, he says, In sacrifice and offerings you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of your book it is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I don't want to dive into any one of these particular passages too deeply because we're going to hopefully pick up a pattern that's where it's going to come up over and over again. But this is one of the more uh, straightforward passages but that seems to contradict most of the book of Leviticus where David writes and he says, burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required or in sacrifices and offerings you have not delighted. So we're going to come back to these ideas in a little bit. Um, Psalm 50, verses 7 down through verse 11. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine the cattle in a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field 
is mine. So he says here in verse 7 that he won't, um, or verse 8, that he will not rebuke them for their sacrifices, but then makes the point in verse 9, or verse 8, that I will not accept a bull from your house or goats, goats from your fold. And it seems to kind of go against one another. Why is it that he uh, says he's not going to rebuke them, but then says I'm not going to accept it? And then he says in verse 10 verse 11 that everything in the earth is his. You know, how is it really repaying or giving God back anything that is not already his to begin with? Another passage we probably know fairly well is Psalm 51. This one has a context given in the heading. This is after Nathan the prophet confronts David about his sin with Bathsheba. David says in verse 16, For you will not delight in sacrifices, or I would give it. You would not be pleased with a burnt offering. Now, you might, if you are familiar with Psalm 51, you're probably recognizing that I'm, I'm, I'm picking out certain sections of text and, and leaving out other ones that we'll come back to later. But David makes the statement, so here is his sin with David and with Bathsheba. Here is his sin with Uriah. All the things that he did wrong as a king, and he says that you will not delight in sacrifices, or I would give it, and you will not be pleased with burnt offerings. Again, this seems to go against the idea of all the laws back in Leviticus of the king having to make certain sacrifices for his sins. But we'll leave that for a minute and we'll continue on. Or Proverbs 21 and verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Here Solomon makes the point that you know, it's more acceptable than sacrifice. Or as you get over into Isaiah chapter 1, I know we're running through a lot of passages, which is why I put them up on the board. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. What, what to me is a multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, or of lambs, or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this of, your, of you, this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbaths, and the calling of convocations... I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assemblies. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me, and I weary of bearing it. Bear, bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes before you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourself clean. Remove the evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. And plead the widow's case. Here is the, the opening salvo to, to the book of Isaiah. And God says, what is all of your multitude of sacrifices? I don't enjoy the blood of bulls or goats or lambs. When you come before me, you know, you're just trampling my courts. Your new moons, your Sabbaths, your um, solemn assemblies, I hate all of them. And even though you make many prayers, I'm not going to hear them. Now, if you're picking up on some of the later verses, you realize there's a pattern that's forming. As you get over to Jeremiah, uh, chapters 1 through 6 of Jeremiah are kind of the introductory. It gives you the setting of the stage. And then chapter 7 really gets into God speaking directly to Israel. Which is why you have this as an opening to Israel. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices, and eat the flesh. For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers, or command them concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this command I gave them, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I command you, that, you may be, that it may be well with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and stubbornness of their evil hearts. And they went backwards and not forwards. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have 
persistently sent all of my servants, the prophets, to them, day after day. And yet, they did not listen to me, or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, and they did worse than their fathers. God is almost presenting a taunt in verse 21. Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. And then he points back to the very beginning, when he called them out of Egypt. He says, I didn't speak to them of burnt offerings or sacrifices. That wasn't the main command that he gave them. He says, the command I gave them was to obey my voice, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. As you get over into Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through verse 8, Micah asks the question, he goes from the reasonable to the, the unreasonable. He asks, well, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with 10,000 rams and with 10,000 rivers of oil? So he takes the reasonable and he goes to the unreasonable. And what is it that's going to, to gain God's ear? This is really the question. How is it that God is going to hear my plea? Shall I come before him with an offering? How about a really good offering? A calf, a year old. Or if that isn't it, how about a thousand rams? Or 10,000 rivers of oil, is that going to do it? So he goes from the reasonable to the unreasonable, and then he goes to the insane. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Is that going to garner God's ear? And then the verse we all know from the book of Micah, there in verse 8, He has told you, O man, what is good, what the Lord has required of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. 1 Samuel chapter 15, maybe the, the first passage you might have thought of in this context. Saul is sent to utterly eradicate the Amalekites. And he goes into battle, and it goes well. He wins. He wins the battle. And he spares the king, and he spares the best of the flock, and he spares some of the people. And then Samuel is supposed to come and offer sacrifices to God post-battle. But Samuel's delayed. And so all the passages in the Old Testament of wait for the Lord, wait patiently for him, well, Saul doesn't. And he gets impatient. And he begins to make the sacrifice. And as he's doing that, then comes along Saul, or Samuel. And Samuel says, well, what is this noise that I hear? Well, wh why do I keep on hearing all of these bleeding animals and well, Saul's answer is well you were delayed so your fault uh, and then the people uh, I was afraid of them so their fault and really I saved the best for sacrifices for God so in the end this was really a good thing and then the famous reply in verse 22 Samuel says has the Lord God as great delight in burnt offerings as and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord God? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. He's, he's putting these two ideas together when it comes to sacrifice and obedience, or sacrifice and contrition. He says one is, is far better than the other. And if you notice the pattern that has been arising through most of these, if not all of these passages is pitting these two ideas together. If I just do what I want to and then throw a couple bulls on the altar, is that going to make God pleased? Or if, if I just act towards you however I want to and then rip open a couple turtle doves and then say I'm good with it, uh, is that going to make God okay? If I do whatever I want to with Bathsheba and then kill whoever I want to and manipulate all the people that I want to in order to hide my sin and then just chuck sacrifices at God and offer incense, is that going to be okay? And that's what we're dealing with. So the question is, why is God so unhappy with their sacrifices? Obedience in a broken spirit is what God has always desired for his people. From the very beginning. 
and to make a sacrifice or by making sacrifices and trying to appease God without being obedient or having a broken spirit, they're treating God like a foreign or like a false God. And if you notice the idol worshipers around their time or any idol worshipers, this is the case. They make him an impersonal God. There's no relationship that happens between an idol and its worshiper. And it's really just to besiege or to persuade. It's a manipula manipulation tool. We need really good crops. I need to make this sacrifice to get really good crops. You know, that, I don't know what it is that the gods are angry about that we keep on getting hail, but we need to kill something in order to make sure that the hail god stops sending hail on us all these times. Can you see Israel doing the same thing? That they look at the nations around them and think, oh, this is how they serve their gods, and it is way more convenient just to kill something and get what I want. And this is what Israel does. So the question is, well, why have sacrifices in the first place? If this is going to create such a confusion, if they're going to sacrifice and God's not going to be pleased with it, then why even have sacrifices in the first place? Well, the answer is pretty simple, is that man is not perfect, and man sins. And sacrifices are there in the Old Testament to atone for sins, but only when combined with a contrite heart. That's the purpose. This is the way that the relationship with God, the, the road back to him is paved with the blood of, of bulls and goats. This is the way that you start the process, but it only happens in in con or in uh, conjunction with being contrite. I want to go back to Psalm 51. I don't think I put this one on the board. I put part of it on the board earlier for the purpose of us opening up our scriptures and reading this one together. So we had noticed earlier in verse 16 where David has said that he will not delight in sacrifices or he would offer them or in burnt offerings. And there, so we had read that in verse 16, I will not, for you will not delight in sacrifices, or I would give it, and you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. And then he makes the point in verse 17 that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So he calls for Israel to do good in Zion and your good pleasure, build up the walls of Jerusalem. And then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. And then bulls will be offered on your altar. He, he's not saying in verse 16 that God is never pleased with sacrifices. That it has no purpose and no function inside of their corporate worship. What he says is, if he just simply offers and does not change his heart, then it doesn't change anything. And so he says in verse 17 that the, the first and primary sacrifices are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, and then in verse 19, you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, and then bulls will be offered on the altar. So the question is, is David going to offer sacrifices? Yes, he is. He has to. He, in order for him to, to restore his relationship with God, he has to go through what God says he has to go through. But not before breaking his own heart and being contrite in his spirit. If we have our math right, and I, I think it would be pretty good to assume that you give a couple months, nine months for pregnancy and a couple months for, for birth. I don't know how long he had been from the time that he had been with Bathsheba initially to the time that Nathan the prophet confronts him, but it's got to be close to a year. And somewhere in that year calendar most likely would have been the Day of Atonement, where the, he, as the king, would have been somewhat a participant in the whole nation of Israel coming together for the sin of atonement and the sacrificial lamb and the scapegoat. They would have done all of that together. And that doesn't alleviate David's guilt or responsibility. He first has to be heartbroken. He first has to be contrite. And then he can offer his personal sacrifices and for them to be accepted. And understanding this, I think, is a critical part of not just understanding the Old Testament, but understanding God's character. 
The problem comes when people try to make sacrifices without repentance or without a contrite heart. Sacrifices are supposed to pave the way back to God, and when we try to use sacrifices as manipulation tools, we profane what is supposed to be sacred, and it doesn't rebuild a relationship. And I want us to consider maybe in, in our own relationship. If someone comes along and does the thing that's supposed to help repair a relationship and they do it only to manipulate you, does it repair a relationship? Usually it makes you a little bit angrier, doesn't it? Like it, it makes things a little more worse. Which is why we got to where we were in Malachi, where God says, I just wish at, some, at this point someone would come along and just close the gates to the, to the temple. Just stop sacrificing altogether. If you're going to do it this bad, don't do it at all. And that's the point here in Psalm 51. And making the sacrifice is the thing that should rebuild the relationship without actually rebuilding the relationship does more damage than good. First, you have a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And then you can perform the sacrifices to pave the way back to God. So let's talk about what we've been talking about, being contrite, which is really just the definition of a broken spirit that is in repentance or in subjugation to God. And there's some key verses about this. Here in Psalm 51 is the main one, that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So of all the passages we looked at where he says, I I despise your new moons and your Sabbaths, your prayers I will not listen, I hate your incense, David says this is something that God is never going to despise. Coming before him broken and contrite, with nothing in your hands to offer other than your obedience and your loyalty to him. God will never despise that. There's some other main passages. We have looked at the earlier part of Isaiah. If you get towards the end of Isaiah, in chapter 57, looking at verses 14 to verse 16, Isaiah writes, It shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. You're expecting something great at this point. He's he set the stage for something amazing, to build up, build up, prepare a way. And then he describes the one who's making this proclamation, the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. But what you get is something unexpected. God says, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is contrite and lowly of spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the spirit will grow faint before me and the breath of life that I make. You think of God as being high and exalted as he is. And he says, the ones that I dwell with, the ones that I spend my time with, those are the ones who are contrite and lowly of spirit. Not with the rich, not with the powerful, not with those of great confidence or great ability. But the thing that anybody and everybody can have if they're willing. To be lowly of spirit and contrite. And then allow him to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. That's what he's looking for. A couple of pages later in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1 and verse 2, the very end of the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord God, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. He makes such a great point. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What could you ever give me? What could you build for me to, that would be fitting for me? If, if we are correct, and I think we are, given 
uh, current market day values for stone, um, copper, brass, gold, and silver, then Solomon's Temple was the most expensive building ever built by like a factor of 10. The gold was God's. The granite was God's. The silver was his. The copper was his. The land on which it sat was his. All they did was reconfigure it in the shape according to his, his will. That's it. What is it that we can offer to God? He says, the one to whom I look is the one who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Psalm 138. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Or as we begin in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You have a consistent message throughout all of Scripture. Or Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and verse 13, Even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. It is so concise throughout Scripture. Are sacrifices what God wants? In the Old Testament, animal sacrifices, yes, but only with a broken spirit, only from the humble, only from those who are contrite. In the New Testament, are we going to be talking about sacrifices that God wants? Absolutely. Does that change? No. That God is, he says, blessed or accepted by God are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So why does God want the contrite over the sacrifices? Because sin is rebellion. Sin is a direct opposition to God's will. Making sacrifices does not solve that problem. If I disobey God and then say, well, I'll just sew up the services on Sunday, it doesn't even out. It doesn't make anything right. God wants us to be his children. But we ruin that relationship with our sins. And only when we are broken and contrite can we begin to rebuild what we have broken down. I want to give us a couple considerations. It's supposed to be if. I'm going to talk to my secretary later. What if we have all the right doctrine, but we don't have a changed heart or a renewed mind? That's what we were talking about in Bible class this morning in Malachi. They had 90% of the right things. They were the right people making mostly the right sacrifices at, with the right priesthood at the right altar in the right city to the right God. And yet what they missed was their heart. Now that changed their sacrifice considerably from what was good and right to what was stolen and lame and blind and sick. But the main thing that God was driving at was their heart. It was a weariness to them, even to bring the worst. And this is a problem that we can easily fall into. Do we, I don't want to say pride ourselves, but that's the word that comes to mind. Do, are we meticulous, that's a better word, are we meticulous to have the right doctrine? I sure hope so. Because having Jesus and having his doctrine go hand in hand. That You can't have one without the other. You can't say, I want Jesus without being obedient. And you can't be obedient without being having a covenant or a doctrine to be obedient to. But what if we are individuals who are meticulous with doctrine and have a heart that's far from God? What if we become the Pharisees of the church who were very meticulous with all their doctrine, but their heart was still far from God? What if we just perform the sacrifices and do the deeds with all of the same evil heart? What if we are the right people in the right place, making the right sacrifices, doing the right deeds, and God would call us and just say, I wish you would close the doors. It'd be better for my name not to even be there than to not have your heart. And this is an individual thing. 
I know that Jesus writes to the seven churches of Asia and talks to them as a whole. And, and that may be the case from time to time, but this is also an individual thing. He mentions, I think it's the Thyatira, that there are some there who have not soiled their garments. Recognizing that even in a congregation full of people who are doing the wrong thing, there are still some who are pure. But the question really comes out in us individually. And I don't know the answer for everybody. It takes some honesty and some openness for us to really look at ourselves and ask, is my heart in it? Am I doing this for the right reason? Do I believe that by coming to services and singing the right songs and taking the Lord's Supper on the right day at the right time, giving the right amount of money, listening to the right boring person, that that how somehow is going to garner me God's ear? If I make enough prayers without changing my heart, is that going to be enough? We see the same heart that's in the nation of Israel in people today where sometimes we maybe want to treat God as if he was an idol. I don't know why all these bad things are happening, but if I just change these couple things in my life, if I just say the right prayers, if I make the right sacrifices, if I forego the right food for the right amount of days, then God will be pleased with me. And God is, I think, very free to say that those things, without contrition, without a lowly spirit, he will despise. But the thing he never despises is a lowly heart and a lowly and contrite spirit. Malachi chapter 1 is where we had, had our Bible class, and I want to look at that, I think, for our, our final passage. This is the verse we had referenced earlier. Oh, that there were someone among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle the fire of my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. I hope that is never us. I hope that's never me. I hope it's never you. That we can say, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these great things in your name? The question is for us, you know, how are you doing? Have, are you humble before God? Are you contrite in your spirit? If that isn't the case, then all, everything else is for naught. Going through the motions, saying the right words, being at the right place will garner nothing without the first important step. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not but despise. And then I will offer right sacrifices. That's the process. That's the order that is given for us. Malachi is calling for God's people to break their hearts in order for them to then have their sacrifices acceptable. And if we have them backwards, if we get in the wrong order, if we don't understand the purpose of it, if we use it as a manipulation tool, then it will garner us nothing. John has picked out number 818 as a song of invitation. I don't think it's for not that in Acts chapter 2, what you begin with is people who are cut to the heart. And then they ask the question, what should we do? Which is repent and be baptized. Jesus then writes to the church in Acts chapter 2 and tells them to be faithful unto death. And if we have somehow missed the beginning steps or we have stumbled along the way and we can help you, let us know as we stand and sing number 818.